Welcome everybody. Thank you for coming out on this blustery day. It's good to see a full house. This will be well worth your time. For people who are new to the building, um, we're St. George's on the Hill Anglican Church. We have washrooms for all of you to use if you go down these doors or you can access by the other side doors or the back into the basement. Denise's talk should be about 45 minutes followed by a question period today. And for those of you who need to run away for an Oscar party, you can leave then. But we ask you if you'd like to stay for wine and cheese after and to continue visiting and asking more questions. And this year marks the 175th anniversary of St. George's on the Hill Church. So we have a number of today. We've got a number of events planned over the year, including a number of guest speakers who will be coming on Sunday afternoons. So check Facebook or the church's website. We've got all kinds of handouts for you as you leave, talking about our next guest speaker, which I'll mention at the end. And today we're very happy to have my friend Denise Harris. I've known Denise for many years through Montgomery's Inn and the Etobicoke Historic Society. She's the past president of the Etobicoke Historic Society, their present historian. She's written many articles for the local papers about houses of interest and different properties. She's a tour guide that leads walking tours. She's a much in demand guest speaker, so we're very lucky to have her with us. Thank you very much for coming, and please welcome Denise Harris. So can you hear me? No? More volume? OK. Well, we'll do the best I can. I'll do the best I can. I have had a cold. There? OK. All right. Although I'm likely to move a little bit from time to time. So, so we're going to talk today about St. George's neighborhood. And um, Lieutenant Governor John Graves Simcoe, he ordered the construction of a big street called Dundas Street very early on in 1794. And ever since, Dundas Street has been really an essential part of this neighborhood, as well as Toronto in general. And pretty much everyone who visits St. George's in the past and today, over the 175 years, had to come along Dundas Street. So that's what we're going to do today, is take a little trip along Dundas in this general area. We're going to start in at the Humber River and talk about Lambton Mills a little bit. Then we're going to go through the area where your church is. And then we'll continue uh, through um, Islington over as far as if we have time, we'll go as far as six points since Six Points is going under some big changes this year, too. Um, you can have a look and see. We're gonna, what I'm going to do is show you old pictures of a place and then and tell you a bit about them, and then I'll be telling you, showing you a picture taken today um, in the same location. And you can see what you prefer, the past or the present. So let's just see, get this moving. Uh, it's been sleeping for a bit. There we go. So now this photograph is taken on Dundas Street, and it's facing east towards the Humber River around 1910. And the street that you see here coming off is there's a street there called Erlington and so some of you may be familiar with that location is and um, here this is Dundas Street going towards the Humber River and you see how the street curves kind of to the it's going down to the the, the bridge over the Humber River so in 1910, that was how you got across the Humber River, was over this low-level bridge. Um, it's a, a quiet day. You can see it must be a Sunday morning or something, because there's nobody on the street compared to what it looks like today. 
Um, there's a couple with a, walking a dog, and that's the only people you can see. The different uh, people who are resident there, this is a, um, I need to be able to see my notes here. So this is Chapman's blacksmith shop here. Next to it, there's a, a, a house that's owned by Thomas Colton. And he was a blacksmith too. But his shop is all the way down the street here. He had to walk a long way to get to work. Next door to that place, that house, is another house and a general store that were operated by Thomas uh, Charles Ware. So to show you, I'm going to show you another picture that I've taken quite some time ago of Thomas Colton's house. So that's a house that uh, was built in 17, sorry, 1898. And that's Thomas Colton's wife, Eliza. You can barely see her sitting on the veranda there looking over. And um, that is a house that is still existing today on Dundas Street in the same location. And that's what it looks like today. Pretty much the same, different, brand, different uh, drapes, obviously. But it's still there, and it is a listed heritage property. And with some, a lot of you will know that Dundas Street along there is getting a lot of desire to tear things down and build condos. So we expect there'll be challenges on some of the streets, some of the buildings like this that are listed as we go forward. Now the picture you saw at the beginning with the people walking the, people walking the dog that is, uh, I'm going to show you what that exact scene looks like today. So there is the, the Colton house, which is still standing today. And this is, instead of the bridge that goes down, you have to go down to the bridge over the river. In 1928, they built this high-level bridge, and that's the bridge we cross on today. Now, just going south of Dundas Street, there's a street called Barry, um, Kingsway Crescent. And at 125 Kingsway Crescent is a house that's generally called the Barry House. And this is a picture of what it looked like in the 1960s. We don't have any older pictures than the, of this place. But um, the Berries came to Lambton Mills in 1890 from Hespeler, Ontario, where he was, and he came here to be a millwright, to manage a mill. And he came with his wife, and he came with his, his in-laws as well. Um, they call it the Berry House, and yet there no, was no evidence that John Berry had ever actually owned the house. And it turned out with a little research that his in-laws are the ones who built the house. And so it should be called the Traplin House, actually, instead of the Berry House. Um, the mill, unfortunately, was unsuccessful. It only lasted for four years. And because he had to find work for his family, he took his family first to, um, he spent four years in Quebec managing a mill there. And then he spent seven years in Little Falls, New York, managing another mill there. But all the while, the house stayed in the family. And when they, re they returned to Lambton Mills in 1914, but John Barry never returned to milling again. Um, he was hired in 1918 as the treasurer of the township of Etobicoke. Um, this was at a time when Etobicoke didn't have a township hall. So he would have done all the work he had to do in the living room of his house. 
Four years later than that, around uh, 1918, they finally got a place to, to have their, their meetings. Um, and he was really sort of a, a different kind of a guy. He was known for his distinctive walrus mustache. And this is a picture. This is a picture of the town council in the 1920s. And he's the gentleman at the back on the left side. And you can see that big walrus mustache that he has. So he also always wore a flower in his lapel on the way to work, even if it was winter. Somehow he would buy a supply of flowers and he would, um, he was known for those two things. Um, he was the treasurer of Etobicoke for 20 years and uh, he retired at the age of 80. Um, and he attended St. George's Church where he apparently uh, played the organ on Sundays for many years. I'd love to know how many, but I couldn't find any record of the actual dates. Um, now, the ownership did eventually transfer from the Traplins as they passed away, and John Barry eventually did inherit the property from his wife when she passed away. And uh, he died in 19, at the age of 92 in 1951. And this is what that house looks like today. It's a charming little house on Kingsway Crescent, just, just south of Dundas Street. And um, it is a listed heritage property. property. And uh, you can see that it hasn't changed much from the picture that you saw before. Now, in an area like Kent Lambton Mills, which has all kinds of milling people working there, there are lots of cottages for workers. And so this is, this is a picture of a house that was built by James McClinchy, who was a local miller, and he built this, it's a double house um, he and his sister lived in one half, and then they rented out the other half. But it was located on Dundas, at, right at Royal York Road. But then what happened was that when electricity was put through in 1903, he, they had to move his house. So it moved a little bit away from Royal York Road towards where the Mastermind store is today. And um, that was fine for a while, but then in 1917, they wanted him to move the house again because they were um, having the Toronto Suburban Railway was running through the area. And so he said that was enough along Dundas Street, and he moved the house to Government Road, which is one road to the south of Dundas. Um, this is what the house looks like today on Government Road. It's a lovely blue color. And the gentleman who owns it, he actually owns both halves of the house. Um, James never lived in, in it after it was moved. He built, he and his sister built another house further along at 119 Government Road. And this is a picture of Hmm. <coughs> Batteries are new. There we go. So that's a picture of, J of James and his sister at 118 Government Road. So that house and the blue house that you saw are both still standing today, and they are listed heritage properties as well. There we go. This is the home of Dr. Thomas Beatty, 
who was a, a surgeon and a physician in Lambton Mills. In fact, he was the first doctor in Lambton Mills. Um, he had this large stucco home that you see in the photo there. And um, you have to keep in mind that doctors at that time, they weren't just physicians, they were surgeons. They also um, were psychiatrists, if that was what was needed. They were ph pharmacists. And he also was the local coroner. So that uh, keeps him, kept him pretty busy. The house was on the north side of Dundas Street, right at the corner of Prince Edward Drive. So that's what it looked like in 1925. And this is a picture of what it looks like today. <laughs> the house is gone. That's a condo that you see there on the site where Dr. Beatty's house was located. Now the next picture, this is the house of Mead Creech. I love his name, Mead Creech. It has such character. He was a builder. He started out, uh, he came from Ireland with his parents, and he was a self-taught builder who ended up building many buildings, particularly in Lambton Mills. This particular building is his own house that he erected in 1874, no, 19, 1896. And in the picture, he's there, that's him, Mead Creech, and this is all his family. This is his, uh, his wife there and various in-laws, and you can't make it out in this picture, but there is actually a wagon, and those are horses' ears here. And that's one of his sons um, were in the picture as well. Um, he built, we're gonna see another building that he built that is still there, because this house, unfortunately, is no longer there. The family lived in the house, some members of the family, until the, their daughter Josephine died in 1968. And it's demolished now, and the property where that house was located, some, some of you may recognize the um, cleaners <laughs> along Dundas Street. I definitely like the house better. <laughs> And another house built by Mead Creech. Well, it isn't a house. Is Lambton Mills Methodist Church, a pretty little church, um, and it was the the second church that they had had, and uh, it was along. Well, you know where it's on Dundas Street. The building is still there, but it's hard to see that it was a church. It has been a, um, well, they, they combined the congregation of Kingsway United Church to become Kingsway Lambton United in uh, 1937. And so they have a new church. Well, it's not new so much anymore, but it's still there at the corner of the Kingsway and Prince Edward Drive. But the old spot for the church is still there as well but you have to look hard to see it. Um, this, is, this is where the, where the church is. That's the peak that you could see over the picture of the church. But I, I could only take the picture by standing on the other side of the street on tiptoes to get the rose window. The rose window is still there but that's really the only part of the church that's there. If you go inside, it's, it's been a retail store since the 1930s, and it's a, it's a carpet store right at the moment. It's had several different uh, incarnations. But um, it's a listed property, though, so if someone wants to try and tear it down, there'll be some people fighting for that just to keep it alive. Now, going, we're going to go sort of leave Lambton Mills, but we're going to cross Royal York Road now. 
on Dundas Street. So we're looking eastbound along Dundas Street in this picture in 1954. And this is, this is Royal York Road. There's, this car is on Royal York Road. So, and the rise of land here where that car is going away from us, that's where the railway tracks are in at that period of time before they built the overpass. The overpass was built in 1960s and into the picture I'm going to show you today. That's what it looks like there today. So, the, so I'm not going to tell you the whole history of your church because you're going to know a whole lot more about the history of your church than I do and you've had lots of um, talks and things go, and going forward but I just wanted to sort of hit a few highlights about your church because over for over 175 years this has been a major landmark in the community it is because of the elevation of land here it has just been an obvious feature of the landscape and one that is been appreciated by people going back as far as indigenous people. They're, they know that um, from uh, archaeological digs that have been done, very minor ones though, in the cemetery they know that uh, First Nations people were living on the land because that height of land gives them safety and, and uh, they could see when the bad guys were coming, basically. Um, so from the high land, you know you're looking down at what was the Lake Iroquois shoreline. So the, um, it's a, the Lake Iroquois was sort of a larger, deeper forerunner to Lake Ontario. But that Lake Iroquois shoreline is a major uh, archaeological location in across Toronto. It goes all across from Toronto and down continues west beyond Toronto. And uh, even within on Toronto in uh, Etobicoke, some of the places you can think of, um, you know the Swiss Chalet at the corner of of what Shorncliff and Dundas. You know the land drops down a bit there? That's the Lake Iroquois shoreline. And so are some of the bigger places you might have seen, like the Davenport in Casaloma and the Scarborough Bluffs. So you are on an important archaeological feature when you're in your church. Now in um, 1844, the high land was presented to the Church of England by a local miller, William Gamble, and that's where your church is located. And uh, they built, um, he's the, William Gamble is the, the miller who built the mill that became known as the Old Mill. Um, and this painting that you see in the picture right now is showing the original stuccoed church that was finished in 1847. And it was dedicated, as you probably know, by the right Reverend John Strawn, the Bishop of Toronto. And he was a very important person at the time. Um, it was designed by master builder William Tyrrell of Weston and you might be interested in knowing there probably were more than this, but there are at least two houses in Etobicoke that are still existing in addition to your church that were built by William Tyrrell. One is on 18 Great Oak Drive. There's a little farmhouse off of Islington Avenue that was built by William Tyrrell. And Applewood, um, the Peter Shaver House on the West Mall was built by the same person who built the, the beginnings of your church. 
Um, and now as the community around the church grew over the years, so did the, your building, obviously, and miraculously inside the church today, it's really amazing that there are three original walls and um, the spire is the original spire that was um, erected by Strawn so many years ago. Now, I, I found this map of the area and I thought you might just be interested in seeing it. It's a map from 1850 to 1860. And just to point out a, a few things here. So Royal York Road is over here and Islington Avenue would be over here. And then this is Dundas Street. And there's at this bend here, that's the lot that your church was on. It still is on. <laughs> but there, there's, a, there's no road here. There's no uh, uh, Wimbledon Road yet. It um, is yet to come. Um, your second rector, Reverend Henry <coughs> Cooper, um, he bought the piece of land behind the church. It's quite a big piece of land. And he put, built a house there, and he drew a picture of his own house, which you've probably seen. It's a lovely place that uh, unfortunately is no longer with us. And um, he um, was the rector for 28 years, and he bought this lot and he built the house and he died in 1899 and he's buried in the cemetery here as well. Um, another person that you can see on the map if I can get it to move back again is John Bull Bagwell. Now isn't that's another great name. John Bull Bagwell <laughs> was um, the owner of Briarley. If any of you remember the house, the Thomas, it was the uh, William Montgomery house most recently when it was demolished along Dundas Street. Um, but he Nobody knows much about him. We know he owned a store in Islington, but nobody knows where the store was. And um, he's the one who took a house that was built in the 1820s. Um, so that's a really old Regency cottage. And he enlarged it into the house that later on Tom William Montgomery purchased. And um, There's a picture here of that house. There, when William Montgomery was living in it with his family. Now, let's see. One other person I wanted to talk to you about was, was this family. Now, I know that's not a pretty picture, but you know, historians will take whatever they can find, and that's the only picture of this house we can find. So this was uh, next door, I'll show you here. But I'm gonna have to move it. There, you know the park that is next to the, to the church here. Um, that park was originally land owned by the person whose house you, I just showed you. Um, he used to own an inn right at the corner of Dundas and Islington Avenue, across from Montgomery's Inn. 
And one day his wife told her husband that she didn't think that it was a nice place to bring up children in a tavern. So they sold the tavern and they bought a piece of land where this park is today. And um, this is, uh, it, they call it the farm, St. George's Farm. And the land is now the Summerland Park. But Elizabeth uh, Smith, who was the, the wife, she's responsible for naming the village of Islington because it was called Mimico, once upon a time. Many of you will be familiar with that. But when they needed a post office, Mimico by the lake beat them to the name Mimico for a post office. So they uh, had a meeting, a bunch of men had a meeting in, uh, in Smith's Tavern and uh, were trying to decide who to, who to name, how to change the name. And nobody could think of anything, so they invited Mrs. Smith to come in out of the kitchen where she was baking. And she couldn't think of anything either, but then they asked her what, um, what, where she was from. And she said she was from Islington in London. And so that's how Islington was named. Now, I've got, just got a few pictures of there, I have a lot of pictures of, of your church, um, and you probably have even more, but uh, just a few pictures I'll just run through here. I love this picture of the church. It just shows the trees and how wonderful they were at the time. This would be about 1910, um, and it's a postcard, because postcards in the 10s and 20s were really popular the time with local photographs on them. Um, this is the same sort of view with the trees again. And then there's a picture taken more recently. The gentleman in the picture is actually the late Robert Given, who was our historian for 45 years, no, sorry, 55 years, which is something. Um, then the, uh, your cemetery is interred over 3,000 soil, souls, and uh, here's just a couple of pictures of the cemetery. Just with a nice view. This is one of the, a tombstone of the, uh, the family who owns the house that's on Royal York, oh, I'm sorry, on uh, um, my name. The older I get, the less I remember names. <laughs> so the house that's on Great Oak Drive, anyway. That's the one of the, um, this is the family of the Moors. Um, and there are many, if you go through the cemetery and, and look at the listings of who's buried there, there are many, many pioneer names of people who are from this church. Now we're going to, how much time have I got left? A while, still. Um, now we're in Islington. And I can't help but talking about Montgomery's Inn be briefly because it is such an important building within the history of Islington. So Thomas and Margaret <laughs> Montgomery obtained the property and built their inn in 1830. And um, they had they had seven children. Unfortunately, only two of them lived to adulthood and one of them died when he was 27. But Thomas, William Montgomery rather, lived to be 90, and as if to sort of make up for all of his siblings, he had, and his wife had, 
10 children, and they all lived to adulthood. Um, Thomas was a farmer, but he was also an innkeeper. And then what, importantly, he was a very shrewd businessman. And he owned land, when, when he passed away, he owned properties, 200 properties, in different places all across Ontario. Um, so he was very rich and his family luckily benefited from that. And the, his family stayed in Islington and owned, they didn't live there necessarily, but they owned Montgomery's Inn right up until it was bought by a church in 1946. So this is a picture of what it looked like when it used to be stuccoed. And that was the way most buildings like this were, were covered at that time. Um, when the city finally bought it, they, um, as a centennial project, they removed the stucco. Nobody would ever do that today because it's not authentic. It should be stuccoed, but it is pretty with the brick as well. And of course, that's what it looks like today, if I can get it to move. I don't know why it won't do that. Pardon? And then you try yes. <laughs> and then just to click it now. Yeah. This is another picture of the inn that I like because it shows you the valley where Mimico Creek is located. It, you can see the inn, but you can see a car coming up the hill. It's in, in the 1920s. And in the distance, you can see the highway, the Dundas Street is still pretty much a rough road. And uh, the spire you see in the distance is up the hill, because there was quite a drop off down into the Mimico Creek Valley. And that's the spire of what was Islington uh, Methodist Church at the time. If you look at, you can, Yes, okay, that's better, good. So the next picture, that's the now picture of this. So you can see the inn on the left, and you can see Barclay Terrace, the condominium at the corner of Islington Avenue. And you can see there is still a hill going up Dundas Street, but it's nowhere near as steep as it was in the original picture that I showed you. Now, I wanted to talk to you about Robert Teer, who I see has plaques around <coughs> here. Um, Robert Teer came from Ireland and built a large home on the corner of Islington Avenue and Dundas Street. So you can turn the, flip the picture. Good. So this is his house in the winter. There's a lot of snow. We haven't seen snow quite that deep yet this year. Um, and the next picture is showing what he did for a living. So Robert Teer, you can't find it, there we go, was a market gardener. And behind his house, so south of Dundas Street, um, he grew vegetables for the most part. And one of the things that his specialty was, was, was um, um, celery. Because in that time period, sort of in the 1820s, no, sorry, 1920s and so on, amazingly, celery was a, um, a commodity that only the rich could afford. They would have vases called celery vases that looked vertical, and people would 
who could afford to buy it would maybe have company come for dinner and they would put the celery out to show that they were able to afford that kind of a commodity. So the picture here is Robert Teer tending his celery. It, by paint, covering the celery with white paper, it stayed um, uh, it was more tender. It was more tender and not as tough as when it was exposed to the sun. Um, the next picture. This is a uh, Robert Teer one year in 1910 was hosted the annual convention of the Ontario Celery Growers Association. <laughs> it was quite an honor. They don't, the, I, that association doesn't exist anymore, but um, he, it had become uh, an important place and there are actually a, quite a collection of photos of people at that con convention. And I think on the photo, what he, Robert Teer is the man standing up, and he's got a tray full of samples of different vegetables that he's grown to uh, encourage people to um, be impressed. <laughs> so the next picture. The Dundas Street Bridge? Well, that what the bridge over Islington wasn't built until 1960. Yeah, that yeah. Oh yes, sorry. That I see what you mean. Yes, that is the bridge on Dundas over Mimico Creek. Yeah, in the previous one, and this is one of his greenhouses. So the next picture, though, is what the now picture of that intersection, and that is where Robert Tears' house would have been located, right where that corner of Dundas and Islington is located. Now, next picture. And this is the McPherson New Love House. It, it has often been called the um, uh, Musson House, but really they didn't, they didn't own it. They did live there for a while renting it. But um, Alexander McPherson um, built this house as an income property in 1879. And it's on the north side of Dundas, just east of the, um, the pharmacy. Um, he built this house, I said, as an income property, but he did, because he didn't live there. He lived on uh, Montgomery Road. And uh, he had been the, he was the Tobacco's clerk and treasurer for 36 years, which is quite a length of time. Um, Thomas and Elizabeth Musson had operated a general store right at the corner of uh, Burnhamthorpe Crescent and Dundas, but unfortunately he lost the store for financial uh, reasons because he, he, there was a big huge delay in settling his father's estate. So he rented this house and for, from 19, 1865 to 1901, the post office, because he was the postmaster when he had his own house, a store, um, it was operated in this house. And in the picture here at the right-hand side, you can see that there's a door standing open, and that room at the back was where the post office used to be. Um, after uh, a while, the uh, owner passed away, and so they um, sold the house to William and Olive Newlove. And Olive became a telephone operator. Um, she started with three subscribers and the rest, uh, within t a decade, it took a while, there were um, uh, almost 30 subscribers in Islington Village. And 
she operated the telephone exchange in that same room at the back where the post office had been. Um, the two children that you see on the front porch are um, their children, and they're Thelma and Dudley New Love. And Dudley is, was an RCAF pilot during World War II, and he was killed in action in 1942 at the age of 27. And he is, um, he's buried in Ireland, but there is a plaque to him on the wall at the back. So he's the little boy that you see in this picture. Now, you can change the slide. So that's what the building looks like today. Um, you may not recognize it if you haven't driven along Dundas past it recently. It used to be painted white. And last year, was it? Maybe the year before. Um, new tenants went in and it is now painted this charcoal gray color. But no matter, it is a listed heritage property and um, it is owned by uh, private individuals and it's been leased out to renters for, well, since the 1930s. Now, am I running out of time, I think? A little bit. Well, no, it'll take, it'll take a while to go through everything that's here. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, maybe I'll finish with one building that you may not have a clue exists in, uh, along Dundas, and I'll finish with that one. So you'll have to move along a little bit till you see the fire hall. Keep going, yeah. There we go. So Islington got a volunteer fire department in 1918. And this is a picture of their first fire hall and their first fire truck. Um, in the, uh, it's a small fire hall. There's just one, one bay here with a, that holds the one truck and then there's a second story up above it. Now the first, uh, it, it was located just west of Cabot Court on the north side of Dundas. Now in 1947, they got their first paid fire officer. Fred Marshall had already been a volunteer for 39 years when he finally started to get paid for it. And the volunteer firefighters were all replaced by full-time employees in 1955. And the Islington Fire Hall um, was built, a bigger one, in 1956. So change the slide, please. And that's what it looked like. In fact, it still looks like that because this building is still there. Um, this was that first bay that they had that I showed you in the first picture, and then they added two more bays so that it would hold three fire trucks. Now, it's been a long time since it's been the fire hall, but the building is still there. Can you change the picture? And that's, that's the former <coughs> fire hall. And this is the outline of that fire hall. And it's, it's three, that's one bay, two bays, and the first bay, the oldest bay. So it's right opposite um, Maybell Avenue. So if you ever are walking along there, doesn't look like a fire hall, but you can see the, the design in, the, in the, the cement that shows you that's where it was. And I bet very few people are aware that that is, was an active fire hall for quite a number of years. So I will stop here. Can just quickly go, just snap through your last photos? Yeah, there's just one. Uh, you, there's some in the middle we skipped. But if you go the next one, once more. Yeah, this is six points. Oh. 
<laughs> so we're looking east, east, and here. Okay, this, let me just find my note here. Yeah, this was a, a hotel and a tavern with a gas station in front. And if you went off this way, that was Bloor Street, and Dundas Street is here. It even says it in the little sign. Now, the place burned down in 1945, but they rebuilt it, and the next picture shows you what it looked like after it was rebuilt. It's not, <laughs> not very pretty, but now you can really see that that's Dundas Street going off here and Bloor Street here, and this is where Kipling comes in, and that's six points. And the, um, one of the reasons they made the big interchange that is now called six points and which is being removed um, is because they were having accidents and people dying, literally, all the time in that intersection. Um, so, this is what the intersection looks like literally today, and if you could just... So it's not going to be just a free-flowing intersection. There will be lights and, and things to control it to make it healthier and uh, less accidents. But this is what the intersection, that's, that's Bloor Street looking towards if you keep going, that's Bloor Street. This is Kipling Avenue going southbound. And Dundas Street is going to go like that, off to the east. So that'll be a big change in a couple. It, it will take a while. It looks like they're coming along quickly, but it's, they still say it's got two more years to go. We shall see. Anyway, so that was the last one.